I'm Adam Pascarella, and welcome to episode 44 of The Power of Bold. From New York City, it's The Power of Bold, the podcast on risk-taking, entrepreneurship, and bold living. Join us as we interview world-class performers, analyze life-changing books, and gather actionable insights to help you achieve your goals. Here's your host, Adam Pascarella. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me in this latest episode of the podcast. For this episode, I'm pleased to bring you my conversation with Alan Manley. Alan is the second Australian guest that I've had on the show, and he has quite a fascinating story. Armed only with a ninth grade education, Alan became an entrepreneur in Australia and is a founder and the managing director of Group Colleges Australia a private educational institution that is based in Sydney. He describes his entrepreneurial journey, including his journey to Group Colleges Australia, in a book titled The Unlikely Entrepreneur. In our conversation, Alan and I touch on a number of subjects, like Alan's introduction into entrepreneurship, what he thinks about identifying opportunities in the marketplace, how he thinks about business strategy and escaping competition, and how Alan, as a non-lawyer, appeared in front of Australia's highest court. So without further ado, here's Alan Manley. Alan Manley, thanks for joining me on The Power of Bold. Thank you, Adam. Now, Alan, you have quite a unique story in your entrepreneurial career that I believe the listeners will really enjoy. Um, But from reading your book, which is called The Unlikely Entrepreneur, it's clear to me that entrepreneurship was something that you didn't initially anticipate or consider. And can we start by explaining to the listeners how you fell into entrepreneurship and really what it is about starting a business that speaks to you? I think, to be really frank, I think I found as a young man that I always knew more than my boss. It was just a foundation point. I thought I was smarter than most bosses. I was able to prove it occasionally at great cost and I then ended up in a computer company which was really good in that they believed in training, Uh, it was a a very progressive company. So I then got to do some more training and and one of the the big threshold probably was that they were doing self-awareness type courses and I recall doing a course and it started to get you to think about what you wanted to be in five years. And uh, interestingly enough, later on, I found out that the corporate stopped that course because too many people left and they all pursued their own career other than the corporate career. Mm-hmm. And I, I was a slower learner then. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I lingered on a bit longer. Then I probably fell into the bit where I did one of those very accelerated MBA courses a couple of weeks, a subject or two, and uh, at, uh, in Boston. And then I really started to feel that uh, I, could, I could do other things. There was, it just opened up my eyes about doing other things other than just working for a very generous, a very nice uh, computer company. I understand mm-hmm. in, uh, in uh, some books that's called a, an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial seizure. And I certainly suffered a seizure and I gave up a good corporate career where I was promoted every 18 months, every two years. So it was nothing to complain about. And I went and worked for a very small company where I became a director. And that was, to me, pretty exciting. I learnt there that the corporate career was very deep and very narrow, but I was very well trained in parts of business. And working for a small company, one was hundreds of millions of of uh, dollars in just that small subsidiary and uh, then I was working for a company that was less than 10 million dollars and I found there that you had to have a very broad knowledge everything from uh, packing things in the warehouse to collecting bad debts uh, particularly before payday it was a very popular occupation for me so I, I learned a lot about the whole stream the whole business model and then I from there set up with myself and another person, which is not uncommon for entrepreneurs to seek a partner because you often sure. don't have the capital or the uh, confidence, dare I say, and you think you'll work well in a team. It's uh, always interesting to watch a team of people setting up an entrepreneurial enterprise 
and they're all extremely highly driven individuals. And you can only imagine why startups have teams for a very short period of time. Very few of the original members last the distance. And that was pretty much our story. And then I, I, uh, I followed opportunities and there was a lot more following opportunities than there was planning. And mm -hmm, uh, right. I guess uh, when you say, once I'd made the decision I'd like to work for myself, which was the, the uh, what would now be a twee term, but that was 30 years ago, that uh, now you're an entrepreneur. In those days in Australia, you worked for yourself. Mm. I know we didn't have those flash French words then. <laughs> so we, we now know about entrepreneurs. So that, that's probably a little bit of it. I think a lot of people go through that when they, um, I've, I've seen and I've now been involved in sponsoring staff on some courses. And uh, some of them will be something to do with self-awareness or where do you fit into society. And we have a 10% shrinkage rate that will, will send 10 staff and one of them will go out and work for themselves. It just seems to be part of the human development. Sure. In, you know, if I can go back to when you were, you know, you know in your, your day job, you had, a, you had a great corporate career, like you were saying, you were rising through the ranks, yet you saw these opportunities um, in the marketplace and, and they were calling to you. Yet at the same time, I'm sure that that felt like a risk to you and I'm not sure... Um, if you're that risk averse of a person or not, if you're more risk uh, embracing, but how did you analyze that risk to to leave that safe corporate job to enter the world of entrepreneurship? I think it it wasn't that it wasn't that high a moral really. Um, it was I was of the view I wasn't getting promoted fast enough. Number one, mm -hmm. number two, I wasn't of the belief I was getting paid enough. And then I was seeing other people who had taken the plunge to go outside the big computer company and be, be in the uh, computer industry, the broader computer industry as a small operator. They made more money than I did and they had far more freedoms. So I think there's a bit of, uh, a bit of push from the establishment that I wasn't getting where I wanted as quick enough. And there's also a bit of pull that the opportunities are there. I was in my uh, early 30s. Mm. Uh, I'd been promoted quickly for eight years. So that goes from 25 to 33, I was there. So from a 25-year-old to a 33, I'd enjoyed quick promotion. And to be fair, the computer industry was slowing down a bit. Uh, the, the boom in mini computers was possibly ending, and I was in the mini computer business. So they couldn't offer me the opportunities that I was now used to expecting. And there were other opportunities out there, and I, I'd sort of had a – I'd seen over the hill type thing, and I, I think – there's a motivation there that I want to earn more money. Uh, I want sure. more freedom. And uh, there's the ego thing saying I was confident I could do it better than my bosses. Right. An entrepreneur, you almost have to be uh, too overconfident, not saying you, you were or you weren't, but it requires that sort of boldness. And that's, that's what my podcast is about. It's about taking calculated, intelligent risks. And, and that's look way of, uh, Yeah, you've hidden uh, crazy brave very well there, Adam. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, it, look, looking back to when you were in your day job thinking of leaving, would, would you have done anything differently? Um, so I suppose it's it's easier to say everything worked out, uh, it clearly did, and that you wouldn't change much. But if you're objectively oh. looking back at, at everything, what would you have changed? Oh, I'd change a lot of things. Um, if, if When you're talking to, oh, I don't know of any entrepreneurs who wouldn't change things. They all laugh about it. But if, if you're really honest, there were, there were some terrible mistakes I made. Uh, my naivety was, was just flattering. Um, I, I probably was confident enough to think I knew more than I did. Uh, but if I didn't have that confidence, I wouldn't have done it. But there, there, was, a, there was a cost to be paid. It cost me a marriage. Uh, that was certainly a lot to do with uh, my entrepreneurial flair to a, certain, you know, to a degree. It was, it was um, having been a workaholic and then becoming a self-employed workaholic. Uh, family don't see it very much. And so that, that's a cost, and it's not an uncommon cost. Sure. Um, sometimes with uh, partnerships, I, I think I could have avoided having some partners, but I felt better with them. I thought it would leverage me up, and uh, that was often a major distraction if I – well, now I don't have partners, so that tells you something. Mm, interesting. Uh, I haven't had partners for 20 years, and people say it's better if you do, and, and uh, I have found – but the legal costs, getting into a partnership is easy. Getting out of it, it, it is very, very difficult. So, And it's a major distraction to the business. So quite often in a partnership dispute, the business stops. 
while you're all bickering and paying right. off lots of new cars. So I, I probably wouldn't have gone into so many partnerships. I, um, the other thing I would do, I would probably, uh, I ended up going from the computer industry into education. Uh, I would, I would think that I missed out on some of the booms of, of the computer industry. Uh, for instance, the smartphone boom. There's a lot of money to be made there. I was quite innovative. I think I would have made more money if I'd stayed in the computer industry, to be blunt. Mm. That's it. There's not much I can do about it, if that makes sense either. You've got so much commitment and you've, you've invested years. In, you've got a skill. You end up locked into these things now. So I, I have a few minor regrets, a few minor regrets. I could have been a lot more... I could have been twice as wealthy, in my opinion, if I hadn't gone in education. It's a very regulated industry, which entrepreneurs don't fit into a regulated industry that well. Sure. And I, I did want to ask you why, why you chose education in the first place. It was just because the opportunity was there. Um, and then that led to Group Colleges Australia. Is, is that how that played out? It was, one, it was the opportunity. Um, if you know, Group Colleges makes money, because it's a little bit different to its competitors. Uh, its competitors, are, they always try and mimic universities. We have a, a private MBA college. So it's very tempting to get university staff and do it the way the big universities do it. They are government funded and they're very slow bureaucracies. So we have to be the, the disruptor. Mm. So if, uh, if you're a disruptor, if you look at the airline industry, for instance, disruptors have new aircraft, not old ones. Disruptors have new work uh, combinations of unionism and or whatever the unions are prepared to do. They negotiate a new deal and they negotiate with new planes, new flash. But what they do, they invariably save in the back office. They have to have the best ticketing system that isn't manual. And we, we copy that to a large extent where we have a completely automated student management system. Hmm. This is hard back as if one of the directors is from the I. IT department. So we have more technology for our students than any of our competitors even think of. Everything's on. Uh, everything's online. Every, there's, we try. We sit up all night almost, working out how a student will not have to visit our student services. We do not want to service students face to face. We want them to go online and solve their problem. And by doing that, of course, it's, uh, there's no queues and there's no staff and there's no manual filing system. Universities to this day are still very, very... Uh, if you go to any university, at least in Australia, uh, on orientation day, there's queues everywhere. We don't have Sure. That. We have it that the student's done 90% of what they have to do on their phone before they even got to the campus. And so this, this technological bias that... Uh, that your your organization has that's it's essentially your competitive advantage, right? You you model it off of the, the airline is, industry, and so say an entrepreneur is listening to to the show right now, they're juggling you know an idea or two that they want to execute on. Would you recommend that they take a similar approach as far as you know determining a competitive advantage and going from there? Good good question. Uh, in Australia, we have a a national survey, a customer survey of all students doing higher education. We make a point of doing the best. We are one of the best in the entire group. Our customers are happier than other customers. That's where we invest money. And where we invest savings is in the back office. Mm. So it's very much like we, we know that if we've got new shiny aircraft that look really schmick, our customer will think we're fantastic. We then have to reduce that cost somewhere and we automate faster than any of our competitors. So the customer sees uh, our customers are doing an MBA. That's our customer is a person in their uh, mid to late 20s who expects they're all carrying one smartphone, if not two. Right. They don't expect to be in a queue. I guess if you're an art student and you've got time to kill and you don't really care, you form a queue at the university. <laughs> Talk about what you did on the weekend. Yeah. Our customers are very demanding customer. They're, they're all going to be. Uh, the MBA has two streams, accounting or entrepreneur. So they're pretty pushy characters. They expect it to be online and fast. So we, we aim at our customer that that's what they expect, that's what we'll give them. They don't really want to talk to someone about filling in a form. 
So that's we're a little bit lucky there that technology appeals to our user base. Yeah, and and if, if I was in their situation, I would probably feel the the same exact way, avoiding any queue and, and just doing everything uh, electronically. So it seems like you're you're definitely tapping into something there. And going going back to your story in the book itself, a, a large part of the book is talking about your experience being an entrepreneur and dealing with years and decades of, of litigation. And I think in the book, you said you had 250 court appearances in a 10-year period. And you even appeared before the High Court of Australia representing yourself. And and I'm, I'm an attorney myself, so I, I can imagine that being very intimidating and difficult for any attorney, but, but let alone someone that hasn't been educated in the law. So that's that's a, quite an accomplishment. Can, can you talk about that a little bit more and your experience juggling this, this oh, litigation? That's a really good, really uh, salient point. And what, what that experience did, and there's not much I can do about it, but it took 10 years of my working life out of my earning capacity. So if you say you start earning decent money from when you're about 30 to when you're 60, imagine you've had a third of that taken off you. Yeah. So that now... It ends up, as the book says, you know, we're within 60 days of losing our last house, our, our residence. We had 60 days to find the money and uh, the bank were moving in justifiably. So I'm well, not anti-bank. We didn't have any money to make the payments. So I was within 60 days. You can imagine the stress in the home front. Uh, for that 10 years, the 250 appearances uh, were intense. Uh, the 250 appearances were over 10 years, but in actual fact, they were con- they were uh, contracted a little worse than that. The first four years, we had lawyers. So the 250 first personal appearances were actually over six years. Yeah. Work out the number of weeks and work out that the courts close for about eight weeks each year in Australia. Uh, you're working out that at, uh, for a two-year period was every Wednesday I was in a court at least once. And it was just grinding now. Thank good Lord, I had a, a fellow defendant and uh, we managed to share that that load. Um, going to the high court, uh, it, it is a life experience for a, an absolute amateur. Um, I, I must confess, though, you would you would imagine, and as you're an attorney, you possibly have some empathy for this. Once you've been to court a hundred times, you finally worked out the procedures. Sure. And you, you've almost done a, a traineeship uh, in law. And you, you've made enough mistakes that people have corrected you often enough that you've worked out that's how you do it in this court. There's, there's only about five levels of court in Australia. There's a local court, uh, what's called a district court, sometimes called county, and then you get state, Supreme Court. We have a Supreme Court at the state level. And then at federal, we have a federal court. And then you have the absolute Supreme Court, which is the high court. The right. absolute court. You can't go any further than the high court. So to get through that, it does take years. Uh, every Wednesday I'd be in court. I would spend Saturday and Sunday looking up, reading up the act that it was relevant to the case, the particular thing. I'd look up case studies. I would go to the State Library and uh, study there. Uh, so I became almost a law student and I didn't work for four years. So that had a tendency to completely drain our life savings and assets. And then at the High Court, one must uh, have a sense of humour to these things, Adam. The, uh, the High Court in Australia, uh, I'm sure it's similar model to the American Supreme Court, and the judges sit much higher than the, the uh, people appearing before them. They're a very high bench, and they, they wear wigs. And uh, in Australia, they have traffic lights, would you believe? And hmm. so when a person goes to speak, there's a green light, you're not surprised, and they have 15 minutes. And that's it. doesn't matter what it's about. 15 minutes is all you get as the opening. 15 minutes and it goes to orange and then it goes to red and then the microphone switched off so they uh, keep control and uh, our character our adversary he um, he argued with the judges that it was really 15 minutes and uh, you don't get to be a high court judge in australia other than very similar to the supreme court in australia and in america it's it's nominated by parliament it's a very serious appointment Mm -hmm. so these uh, gentlemen there was two gentlemen on the day of yeah, two gentlemen on the day, full bench that becomes. Uh, you can have one bench, but we had two bench, a full bench, being two judges. They were, um, shall we say, not people to be pushed around, Adam? <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So wait for it. They said, all right, okay, okay. 
<laughs> we're not going to argue with you, sir. You can start again. So we went through the same thing, 15 minutes, and no one interrupted him. We're all very good. And they said, right, now you, you're happy you've had your 15 minutes? Yes, yes. And there I am on the other side, Adam, and I've got these three ring binders, and I've got mm -hmm. a best. And this took me best part of six months of my life to prepare, and it's got the yellow little stick-ons sticking out, the green ones and blue ones, and they're all numbered, and I can answer any question any way it comes, Adam. I'm sure. ready, like a tiger, heart pounding, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and then the other gentleman finished, and they said, we're going to take a break now. So, oh, terrific. I'm ready. No, break. They disappear for, I don't know, say five minutes, seem quite a while. They come back, reform. Everyone stands up. You know the ritual. You've seen it on TV. Mm -hmm. Then the um, superior judge, the gentleman who's running the show on the day, says, uh, Mr. Manley, we won't be needing to hear from you. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. That's always good news. Say, you don't understand. You <laughs> don't understand. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, I'm told by veterans, that means that there's no case you've, uh, you've won. Yeah. So uh, that was pretty exciting. It took uh, some period of time to come down from that experience, to be honest. I'm sure. And that, like you said, it's unbelievable. You prepared months and months to, to make your case before the court and uh, <laughs> you didn't get the chance, but that was for, for a good reason, obviously. And, and for those, those listeners who are entrepreneurs or even non-entrepreneurs that may not deal with litigation uh, that substantial or with that high of stakes, what lessons can you take from that experience and, and deliver to those listeners who are entrepreneurs? Uh, well, uh, people... In part, if I answer that in two parts, Adam, people often say, how did you get yourself into that situation? Uh, the bit we didn't say there, Adam, was, was a vexatious litigant. It was a, uh, a person who basically blackmailed people through the court system. And how did I find that person in my life by absolute accident, one in a zillion, and uh, very, very unfortunate that it happened that the person one would have to think, why would they be so motivated other than... The, uh, the claims were for millions of dollars, so there, there were uh, potential opportunities. If I lost, it was devastating. Sure. Um, what would I recommend others? Uh, I actually have always tried to avoid litigation. Um, usually, you can earn more money doing other things. Mm. Now, if you've got a partner who wants to sue you, you don't have much choice other than to have it resolved by law because you're not likely to get guns each and shoot each other so right. you, you end up in that situation that takes me to what i uh, occasionally i write articles and such about entrepreneurs are setting up a business and i i know i sound really boring there's two things i keep going on about is cash flow cash flow and cash flow mm -hmm. and exit how are you going to get out what's your exit strategy when you're one of you is sick of this one of however many there are in the partnership or club or whatever how are you going to get your money back out? And it's it's really interesting to watch people. We all fall for it. And one of the things I fell for many times, you, you get really excited about the venture and it becomes, you're, you're living the dream almost. And then um, you wanted to do it and now you're allowed to do it. And then you wanted to do it and you are doing it. Well, this is really exciting. So a little workaholic switches on and away you go. Never thinking that this may all fall apart personally at any time. And when you've got other partners, well, you don't know what's happening in their life ever. One yeah. never knows what's happening in their world. So you're, you're putting your whole future based on a person that you won't know how they're going to react to success or failure. And I, and, uh, I used to have one partner. <clears throat> one of his good sayings was there, there was two times when people would have a dispute is when there's not enough money on the table and when there's too much. Too much, yep, yep. And uh, that, that it proved to be true a number of times that when <laughs> things were going really well, I'm sure you've heard this from other entrepreneurs, things were going really well and the partnership fell apart. And it's often because they feel that they've worked too hard or they've worked too long and they haven't got a, a dividend from their effort. And yet another partner saying, we're halfway there. We're, we're halfway up the mountain. We could be really rich. And it's very hard and, and it's very hard to get people to understand that the exit clause is probably more important than what you're going to agree to do to each other. Yeah. Yeah. So taking note of that when you're starting the partnership is something to definitely um, pay close attention to. And, and just, just to wrap up here with one, one final question, I noticed something in your book that really was interesting to me and spoke with me. And you said 
you came across an important discovery. And that's if you think you're in a particular business, you actually may be providing another critical service or product for the customer. And can you maybe provide an example of, of that in your own career, just starting a venture and realizing that customers or clients are using it in a totally different way? Well, one of the ones was I, I touched on before, interestingly enough, if you were to work out how Group Colleges Australia, my company, makes money, it's actually in the student management system. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you uh, have a building, you rent, lease or whatever, you lease a building, we'll say, in the economic model, you lease it, you pay rent, you get good instructors, they cost you 10% more than the guys down the road, it's not a vast amount. Uh, you have classrooms, they look amazingly similar. You put the latest smart board on the front with you know, a su- interactive whiteboard, all that. It's pretty much a standard model. Where we make money is actually, if you look at, G- at GCA's profit line, it is because the more technology we provide, the more the students like it. Right. Having good lecturers is not that hard. Having good service when, for instance, uh, how fast are the marks provided? That's the service. They've done the work they'd like to be assessed. How fast can you get that to them? Uh, if, for instance, a timetable, would you believe? Uh, people often travel half an hour or an hour to get to college. If they find a sticky little yellow note on the door saying, uh, Wilbur's sick today, that's an hour of their life for nothing. Sure. We, we have people send, they get texts as soon as we know something like that. If we can't cover it, which is our strategy, we do cover it. But if we can't, we'll send you a text and we keep sending it until you say you've got it. <laughs> we, we, we offer, we're offering a scheduling service. Mm-hmm. One of the things the students like, believe it or not, when we do surveys, they love our scheduling service. It doesn't waste their time. Yeah. Right. So what, what, what service are we really providing? We're providing education, but there's a difference between our education. It's actually a student management system. Absolutely. And the way to discover the, the other way your customers, students, clients, whoever it is, is using your product is just by speaking with them, I'm sure. Right? Right? That's, that's the best strategy to discover that. Well, we do, we do surveys. Uh, we're survey intense. Uh, not every institution is. Uh, we do surveys every uh, semester and every teacher has a survey. So every class you're attending, you will get a survey. It's on, the, on your smartphone and the students get told the results. They get told if the class was happy or not happy. So we actually we openly share with the students what the results were. We share the results with the lecturers. Or they're um, depersonalized, but the lecturers can work it out, I guess. They're not dumb. But they, they can work out that the team is performing well or if a team member isn't performing well, then I guess they would be expecting some counselling to get that team member back up to speed or, or whatever the story is. Right. And then all of this feedback constantly feeds on itself and your systems keep improving and students become happier. I'm assuming that's the <laughs> that's the goal. And it's, it sounds like it's working very well. Well, well, Alan, this has been really terrific. We just touched on some of your story and some of the lessons in your book. Again, the book is called The Unlikely Entrepreneur. And finally, if listeners want to learn more about you or the book, where should they go? They go, would you believe, online, alanmanley, one word, dot com, dot au. And you can, you can read all about me or even buy a book. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again, Alan. This was a real pleasure and, um, and good luck with everything in the future here. Likewise, Adam. Take care. Thanks again to my guest, Alan Manley. I hope you remember some of Alan's key insights as you pursue your entrepreneurial journey. And even if you don't want to jump full-time into entrepreneurship, Alan clearly has some valuable insights if you want to launch a side project after work or even an initiative at your day job. By being bold and taking action, you will probably find that good things will happen. So that's it for this episode of The Power of Bold. For show notes and a transcript of this episode, visit thepowerofbold.com. There you can also find my free mini course on the art of cold emailing, along with a link to my longer course on how to podcast without wasting your time. If you have any questions about this episode, the course, or anything else, you can also email me at adam at thepowerofbold.com. So thanks again for listening to this latest episode of The Power of Bold. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Power of Bold. 
For show notes and a transcript of this episode, visit thepowerofbold.com. Feel free to get in touch by visiting our Facebook and Twitter pages. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play. We'll see you next time.